Um, we will have some people getting logged in. If you're watching this not live, you may want to skip ahead a couple minutes just to uh, as people will be getting logged in. Now, one of the things this will, we usually kind of when we do our Club Cubase Google Hangouts, one of the things that we do is uh, actually kind of, it's more of a Q&A format, but this will probably be more of kind of like a uh, more of a featured presentation. So it's going to be a little different, but we'll be able to kind of answer questions as they come up. But uh, we'll have kind of more of a structured format. Uh, but uh, my name is, again, Greg Undo. Uh, I'm broadcasting from Northern Virginia in the United States. Um, and if you want to go ahead and please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Uh, that'd be uh, really helpful. It's always interesting to see where people are from. But we're going to let some people get logged in. We have some more people getting logged in as we speak. Um, so feel free to introduce yourself and we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Um, we had a lot of people that had wanted to do a very specific uh, Wave Lab session uh, during some of the uh, Club Cubase Google Hangouts. So we wanted to do something uh, a little uh, dedicated to Wave Labs since it's such a wonderful program. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. So please feel free to introduce yourself and we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Uh, you can tell us what your name is, where you're from, and then we'll go ahead and get started here in just a little bit. Uh, so we'll walk through a lot of different aspects of Wave Lab and different things that you'll be able to do with it. So take a look, we see some more people getting logged in. And if you have any questions or topics before you get started, please feel free to go ahead and ask in the comments field. So you can enter in the, in the live chat area. So wait a couple minutes for people to get logged in. All right, we have Jan or Jan maybe from Holland. Thanks for joining us today. And some more people are getting logged in. And we'll get it started here in just a couple minutes. So once again, if you're watching this offline, uh, we may wait till about five minutes in to get started. We'll see if there's any questions. Yep, so Wave Lab is kind of a, you know, has many tricks up its sleeve. So it's kind of a secret weapon to uh, many audio engineers and mastering engineers. And so we'll show you some good tricks. All right, so we see Rob from Holland. Good to see you online. We have Holland well represented today. That's good. And Rob asks how I'm doing. I'm doing really well. All right, so maybe we'll do one more minute and we'll get started. So uh, if you have questions as we go on, this will be, as I mentioned before, a little bit different than other sessions where people will just kind of have tons and tons of questions. Uh, so this will be more of kind of a, I think it's titled as a Welcome to Wave Lab as kind of a feature uh, presentation, but we'll go ahead and get started here soon. But if you have questions as we start to go through this, uh, please feel free to kind of make a comment in the comments field. And if not, we'll go ahead and get started here in just about a minute. And for those people who are just kind of logging in, if you want to go ahead and just uh, in the comments field, just do a quick introduction. Tell us where you're from. We have a couple more people just logged in. All 
Uh, question, does Wave Lab support any control services? Yeah, you can set up uh, control services. Does some, I think it does some basic Mackie control. I use it with my CC121 for transport and volume control. So yeah, you, you can map things out uh, through keyboard shortcuts as well. Um, but I use it all the time with my CC121. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll get started. Uh, one of the things, you know, Wave Lab kind of historically started off as a sample editor. I remember when it first came out, it was about 22 years ago. Uh, you know, people at that time were just starting to get away with not recording their masters onto a DAT and then, you know, would do their wave editing inside a Wave Lab instead now it's kind of a paradigm shift from moving from like a dat tape or two track to computer based for your mastering uh and one of the things that we wanted to do also was uh that led naturally to doing cd burning and mastering and doing real-time effect processing uh which led to i think in version three added the audio montage which is kind of a sample based uh it's kind of a multi-track editing environment uh that could be used for doing a lot of stuff like radio spots or uh if even if you're doing some more complicated mastering and then we got into more spectral editing and they kind of have always done a tremendous amount of features but you know in the one way i'd often describe wave lab is it could be kind of the most compelling kind of the the best bang for your buck to radically improve the quality of your audio so most people will take wave lab and treat it as once the audio has been created and mixed in a program like cubase really putting that extra polish on it and making sure that if you're doing a cd or a collection of songs that these will all make sense and be able to you know uh, make sure that you know you're going to have consistency tonally, consistency in levels, and there's also some really advanced stuff for batch processing when you're dealing with you know tens of thousands of audio files and being able to effectively work with them. So when we actually kind of look at this, we could actually see Wave Lab since version nine has kind of been broken down with a new zone interface and new ribbons. So you could actually just kind of see your file menu here and then you'd see appropriate zones or if you go to your edit to analysis to analyze to render so you see these different windows that are kind of broken down into different zones uh, and everything's going to be kind of context sensitive so you constantly don't have to search through and some of these functions are still within menus but it's really designed so that you don't have to do it with menus now we often will see this paradigm of seeing like a stereo waveform uh, and what gets to be really interesting is you know you could you know look at her we play with some audio and we can see this as a couple of different ways so i can see my stereo waveform not only can i see my left and right channels but what i'm able to do is also to see ms so if we think of stereo you know, a lot of people think of stereo as being uh, left and right, but really there's kind of a whole other stereo component, and that's what uh, elements of the audio are in the middle part of the frequency, or the middle part of, not frequency rather, but the panning spectrum and what's on the sides of the panning spectrum. So you could actually just click in the lower left-hand corner and switch between your left, right, or your MS view. Now there's also another view where you could see the loudness that's going on and you can see these different colors will represent different frequency ranges and also if I wanted to see this as my spectrum view where I could see what uh, frequencies have kind of active harmonic content so we could just kind of see that just from looking here now you could have the overview window be one view and a completely different view directly in the main edit view so if i say okay i want to see a waveform and i want to see ms on top or i want to see left right here and my ms on the bottom you could really kind of custom tailor that particular view quite easily um 
Now, when we see our meters here, now it used to be that these meters were designed for many people had multi uh, monitor interfaces. So, uh, you know, where you're running two or three separate monitors and people would have these meters. And what's kind of interesting is that many people now obviously are working on powerful laptops that, you know, can often, you know, give them enough power where they don't need to have a dedicated desktop computer. So we could actually look at your metering and some different options here. So I could have frequency based meters, level based meters. I have a phase scope here. So one of the interesting things is if we wanted to reposition the meter windows as we see fit, I could actually just kind of drag these around. And what's interesting is line here. Uh, and then if I move it to the top, I could have like my phase scope window directly above. Or if I move it to the bottom, I could have it below everything. Or if I wanted to have it stacked with this window, uh, I could put it to top or the bottom of this window. And again, you could just literally just kind of drag, you know, just by the name here. And then you're going to be able just to drag these different components as you see fit. If I wanted to kind of dock it on my right hand side, I could do that and I could just kind of expose and over just click my mouse right there and I could have my meter window. Or again, if I want it to be just kind of placed directly here and for it to be tabbed, we could do that as well. So what's interesting is, you know, there's kind of an uh, unconventional keyboard shortcut for switching because you have you can have different tabbed meter groups going across the top here so this section here will be frequency based by default this will be level based and we see phase we have kind of a kick out window here for our bit depth so as we play back our meters what's interesting is i could just hit like the number one followed by the y key and then I could just toggle my meter. So my one would give me my level meter. Two followed by Y would give me my R128 loudness meter. Three, four could give me, four followed by Y can give me my frequency, my spectroscope. Or if I want to see a spectrometer, I would hit six plus Y would be my bit depth and if I want to see my counters 3 plus Y is my phase scope and then if I hit 7 Y that would be my oscilloscope 8 followed by Y a wave scope so you could quickly switch between different meters very easily and these meters can be undocked they can be placed anywhere in your screen or they can be kind of tucked away uh, in various uh, areas of the program by default. And if you wanted to, you could actually save these as different workspaces so that everything you do could actually be seen. Uh, you know, you could have it custom configured exactly if you wanted this to be, you know, a little shorter or, you know, change the size, you could custom tailor that and save your different workspaces. Now, what else gets to be interesting and very powerful is dealing with our master section. So when we see our master section, one of the things is, you know, many people when they do mastering, they could have multiple sets of monitors as a reference. They may have small speakers. They may have like large speakers. Like I was just at a studio the other night that had Meyer X10s, which sounded incredible, but they're $60,000. You know, those will translate pretty well uh, across. But many people, if you wanted to switch between different meters, can just simply do so right here. Now, you saw before that we could do, we could see our audio as left, right, or mid side, but we can also choose to monitor our audio sources in that way. So if I wanted to come here, I could say, let's just mix down to mono, or I could do a mono with, the, with left minus right. Or if you just wanted to listen to the left channel or listen to the right channel only or 
or just the mid or just to the sides so I don't have to have any like really sophisticated plugins this is just will be built into wave lab so it's really interesting being able to kind of critically listen to different components again now to our mids it's going to fall down to mono or how it's going to be in stereo so it gets to be like really an interesting way of being able to uh you know have your different components with that now within our master section uh, we also have the ability to add multiple plugins so one of the plugins that comes with wave lab that will actually uh, take a, a more detailed look at which is pretty compelling is the master rig so once i open up my master rig plugin and this could be uh you know a series of different plug and mastering processes all combined so let's say if i have my eq set up here and then i wanted to have let's say another plugin such as you know perhaps another uh dynamics plugin i could just come here and we'll open up let's say a multi-band compressor now what's interesting is even though I have, you, you may notice that the plugin interface just completely changed. But now that I have two different plugins set up, what I could do is actually just set up and I could click here and we could tab our different plugins directly here. So when I see any of my plugins that are installed in the signal chain, I can say, okay, here's my master rig, here's my multiband compressor. And if I wanted to just change the order of the plugins, you could just simply slide the plugins like so. So it gets to be a very powerful way of being able to effectively be able to, you know, see your plugins without always having to uh, click a zillion different windows. Now, if I just wanted to remove a plugin, I could just right click and click remove. Now, when we do a lot of processing on our master section, one of the things gets to be that sometimes you may have different gain changes. So say, if I come here and I do processing, now sometimes you don't know if it sounds better because of the plug-in processing or if it sounds better because it's louder. So if I bypass the plug-in, you may not be able to effectively get an idea if it is just louder or if it's actually better. So one of the things that we give you is called a smart bypass. And what this will allow you to do is, and you could just open this directly from the master section, is we could listen to our original audio file. Then I could listen to the process audio file with any gain changes. So I'll add more gain change. So I go back to my original. But now I could listen to the audio with the effect processing without any gain changes. So now if I wanted to listen to the gain changes, to the original, or to the processed audio with the gain corrected. So as we just kind of go back here, it's our original. Louder with the EQ. Now the same level, but with the EQ. So the smart bypass is really clever for being able to uh, handle that situation. Now we could also not only use any of our VST2 plugins or VST3 plugins, but what we have the ability to do also is just to come here and we could have external processing. So if you have a favorite compressor that you like to use, what you're able to do at that point is just to have that as an external 
pl- plug in as your uh, under your ASIO gear, and then that, at that point you could just choose to actually you know go out to a favorite mastering EQ or compressor uh, of your liking. So gets to be very fast and easy way to effectively handle all of your various um, processes that you see in the master section. So uh, we're going to see if we have any quick questions on that. I see some comments coming in. So let me just read through those and then we'll move on to the next section. I'm not sure we had a question if the uh, WaveLab Elements version supports the multiple monitors. I'm not absolutely sure, but um, I think there's a pretty detailed comparison chart. Um, but that way you could have that set up. We'll see if there's any other questions that come in and we'll kind of move on to uh, some of our next section. Seeing good comments on the smart bypassing. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's a great feature. Sometimes our brains are always uh, very dumb in thinking that uh, louder is always better, but sometimes it's nice to know that what you're doing is improving the quality of the audio, and if it gets a little louder, it could be okay. But we want to make sure that the processes that you do are actually going to uh, have an impact directly on the audio as well. Now, one thing I, I also want to show in the uh, processing here so let's go back to our master uh our master rig plugin and we'll look again more at this in more detail and we saw that we could do uh let's say processing uh across you know if i wanted to apply this eq and we play back our left and right channel that we could actually uh you know it's going to process all of the audio but if you actually click to this little icon to the left at this point, I could just have it uh, process only on the left channel, the right channel, the mid, the side. So each of the plugins, I could have it only affect various channel configurations and panning configurations as well. So if I wanted to do that processing only in the middle where perhaps like a vocal was a little too hot or if I wanted to bring it up, I could choose just to do like a particular plugin just on the mid or if I wanted to compress the sides because it was a little too wide sounding. So each of the plugins can also be applied anywhere for from, you know, the stereo, mono, left, right, mid, side channels independently as well. So it makes it incredible flexibility. All right, so let's take a quick look at, since we have our master rig open. Just reading through some of the comments here. Uh, we got a question about elements not supporting the external hardware. I believe that's correct. So the WaveLab elements won't do it, but the Pro version will. Uh, and someone that has a CC-121, so all your transport, your master uh, volume control will work directly from, uh, will control your master volume here as well. Now, one of the things also I should point out is, you know, there's a couple of different processes that could be really interesting. Because a lot of times people will be doing uh, different processing capabilities and when they're delivering, we'll deliver to different formats. So when we wanna do this, one of the things that we could actually do is when we come here, we're also gonna have full high quality dithering, but one of the things we're gonna have is a playback processing. And there's a plug in here called the encoder checker. Uh, that's really interesting because what this is going to allow you to do is a lot of times we may be delivering audio files within different file formats. Um, so what we could do is just come here and I'm going to just say, okay, I wanted to actually listen. Uh, and sometimes when you're doing a mix and you encode it to like an AAC file or to an MP3 file, you realize that some of the decisions that you make in mastering uh, might be... 
uh, you know, lost in those different encoding realms. So what we could do here is we have our encoder checker and we could actually just select different encoding options and we could do this in real time. So I selected an AC file uh, and from iTunes and MP3 and an AUG Vorbis file. So if I play back my audio, what I could do with my encoder checker is just kind of click here. And now if I want to listen to it, how it's going to be encoded with my AAC or how it's going to be an MP3 or AUG Vorbis. I'll get my original audio to an MP3. Now to an AAC. And back to the original file. So here I can actually make the critical decisions before uh, we actually do encoding and realize that there could be an issue that we wanted to do EQing or different adjustments for. Uh, so we'll be able to adjust that very easily using the encoder checker because it's oftentimes many people will actually be able uh, kind of calls up saying why is this sound odd or different or unexpected. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at the master rig. And as I mentioned before, this is kind of a uh, a beast of a plugin. Um, this is you know, perhaps one of the most powerful mastering processors uh, that I've ever seen in any program. And the most important thing is it sounds really phenomenal. So one of the things that we notice is we can have different slots here. Um, and so, you know, we can have multiple different types of processors. So to, by default, you'll have an eight band EQ and this EQ uh, like just like we had noticed before so when we come here we can just say okay we're going to just have our EQ um, so let's say I'll just come here to this EQ and we have eight bands now what's interesting is each of these bands uh, when we go look at you know we could have on our outer bands we could have them be high shelf low shelf but we could also have it 48 db of cut if we wanted to so if you want to do low shelf or if you want to do uh peak or notch filters we could have each of those kind of set up so let's say i just want to do uh, like a low shelf filter here on band one now we see that we could have this be for our stereo uh, frequencies but again if i come here i can now have like each band be independent for the mid and the side frequencies if I wanted to. So if I wanted this to be, uh, you know, more, I wanted to adjust the frequency of this band, but tighten up the Q, but have on the side a wider Q, we could do that. Or you could EQ, if we kind of click here, you could also just EQ left and right independently. So each band could work as stereo, mid side, or left right independently just just like that and you see that each band also has its own color so you could kind of clearly follow the colors and you see the color scheme and just like what we see in cubase so if i wanted to come uh directly to this eq band i could just if i know that my song is in the key of g i could just type in g6 for my frequency and i could just actually type the note name in for that particular frequency so I could come here and again, I have complete control over the, you know, I could have gain control coming out of this particular output. If I wanted to add more gain going into, let's say, uh, when I wanted to go, we'll go to our multiband compressor. And again, our multiband compressor, once we look at it, I could adjust the frequency, the Q. Um, but as we do this again, I could have that for stereo, mid, side, or left, right. So we're going to have a four-band multi-band compressor, and each band could have its own side chain input as well. Uh, so again, you have the flexibility. You'll see it as kind of a common theme 
being able to do processing, you know, on mid side, left, right, or the stereo spectrum independently as kind of a common theme throughout WaveLab. Now, when we want to go to, we have dynamic EQs as well. And again, we have stereo mid side, left, right. So just a very powerful way of being able to EQ and apply your, you know, dynamics processing, uh, getting into our saturator. So as soon as we go into our tape saturator, we could have this be a tape or tube. And again, the multi-band stereo left, right, mid side on each of these bands. Now, what's really interesting, if you kind of come here, you could just change the order of the signal flow here. And this is all kind of within one plugin. Now, as I've made adjustments here, something else that's interesting, if I wanted to adjust a drive, I could do this, but we have an undo history within the plugin itself. So if I just come here, we can just have complete control over our plugin. Now, something that's really an interesting concept is a multi-band uh, like stereo imager. So this way I could apply just the uh, like the high frequencies I can make wider sounding but if I wanted the low frequencies to be a little tighter I can control the stereo width of each of the bands and that way if I wanted different components to be different amounts of wide uh, so I may want the high end to be wider sounding but not muddy up the low end we could do that and of course we could have our multi-band limiter and within the limiter we could have not only kind of a transient designer, we could have three different transient designers. We could have kind of harmonic control and your limiting capabilities here. So all of this within one single plugin can really make, you know, for just, you know, incredibly powerful mastering suite all within one plugin. Now, when, one of the things that's really interesting, let's say we just kind of start from scratch. And, you know, if you had to have only one mastering plugin, the master rig is pretty phenomenal. But, you know, if I'm just EQing, let's say, for instance, this track, and we'll just play this a little bit, we could also put on this preview mode. So as I adjust the EQ, I only hear what's going on with that EQ until I let go then I can hear it in context so I want to put just a little sizzle on the vocal and then you let go then you could hear everything within context of the actual audio as well so it gets to be Again, an incredibly powerful plug-in to do just about any mastering needs. And, you know, we've I've done some presets for kind of a well-known mastering engineer who lives near me. And, you know, he's just found this to be like his new secret weapon just with the amount of power that it has in it. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll move on to some audio editing next. I'll just look at comments, see if there's any questions that have come up. And if not, we'll just kind of move on. All right, so we're seeing some comments like the encoder checker being brilliant, a lot of people learning new tricks, so that's great. So um, that's why we do these things. Um, so one of the things that you know WaveLab is just really amazing at is just kind of raw audio editing. You know, so when we come here, we can select you know our different edit tabs and kind of all the things that you would expect. So if I wanted to come here. And let's say I just hit delete, I could get rid of audio, or if I just wanted to cut out a section of the audio itself, I could just hit like control X, so cut, that will just knock the audio directly over. Now something that's really interesting, let's say I just move, uh, if I just kind of take my WaveLab window here, and one of the things that we could do is if you just take you could actually just even just drag a little bit of the audio just move it directly over there uh if you wanted to adjust gain you could do like you know just command g but you'll see gain here 
as well. So, or if you wanted to do, you know, different fade ins, fade outs. And again, you could just kind of this ribbon interface, you want to put in markers. And again, okay, I just wanted to fade out that or fade in that part. And you, of course, have unlimited levels of undo. Now, if you actually drag this out uh, to the desktop, let me see if my windows will allow me to do that. Um, let me just see if I can. But if you just drag a portion of the file out to the desktop, you could actually create a new file based directly on that particular section. So, you know, if you wanted to come here and just say, okay, I wanted this to have more gains. Like you say, okay, I just want to be 3 dB hotter. And I could just come here. And of course, you could just have completely unlimited levels of undo. So all the things that you would expect in kind of a typical sample editor. But again, a lot of people take what we actually do here and you know, we'll take a project like a multi-track project from Cubase and load it directly into WaveLab. So I have Cubase uh, opened in the background here. Let me just, so let's say I have this file and I'm using the same audio interface and I have kind of a classical piece here. So since we make both Cubase and WaveLab, we thought it'd be cool if you could now when we come here and we go to our export audio mix down, one of the functions that you have is the post process. So here I'm going to choose to open in WaveLab Pro 9. So at this point, I'm just going to say export. And even if I didn't have WaveLab open, it would actually open up WaveLab in the background. And we'll just go ahead and we'll close this window. And let's say I want to close this project in Cubase now. And we'll just sneak back to WaveLab. And here's the project that I just exported directly from Cubase. So I don't have to like save it to a drive and, you know, worry about where to load it and open up WaveLab independently. The project that I just mixed is just loaded directly into Cubase now, or, or loaded directly into WaveLab rather. Now the cool thing is, let's say I'm listening to this and I'm like, okay, I really need to make a change and I'm kind of faking it by doing it mastering. I shouldn't make this change. It's an actual mix problem. What I could do now is just come over here. I'll choose the edit and then I can say, and remember that I closed the project in Cubase and I'll say, let's edit the project and then what you could do is actually that will let's see if we get this right sorry for all the window juggling and you can see that that's loading that project back into Cubase just get out of my video service and you can see that now I could have that two-way communication so I could take my project from Cubase load it directly back in and mix it down directly to WaveLab or if I need to go back and make a tweak to an, a mix component at that point I could take it from WaveLab and the Cubase project will automatically be loaded up to match that so it gets to be a really great kind of two-way communication between the two programs that makes a lot of sense. Um, so let me just go back to some of my notes and I'm gonna read some of the comments. Yeah, so seeing some comments that the two-way communication is incredibly awesome. It is, so it's a, a really great way, you know, because, you know, we, you know, we at Steinberg go, oh, we could actually make this cooler and better. Um, so, you know, we could do those types of things. Now, again, we mentioned, you know, the ability to take, you know, your different files here and be able to bring in, you know, you know, to see it in different ways. So let's say uh, if I have just like a classical piece, 
and I wanted to look at it in my left or right or mid side. Let me just take something that's uh, perhaps a little more conventional. So let's say if I wanted to make this mix sound a little bit wider and we're just kind of listening so we see our mid and our side on top. I could actually just double click on the side channel. And then when I go to process, we could add gain. So let's say I just want to make it sound wider. Let's exaggerate it. But that way I could just bring out the sides without affecting the voice. So th those are some of the little mastering tricks that a lot of people will use that, you know, it's like, oh, what did that mastering engineer do just to make such a big change in something that was so subtle? And often dealing with mid and side is kind of a common theme that we will see, uh, you know, in mastering to do that. So let's say we wanted to um, do some now do some audio restoration, uh, and I've made some of the best money that I've ever made on any projects uh, in Wave Lab, and I've done a lot of kind of legal work, you know, uh, stuff that I never thought I would do as a you know musician. Uh, but you realize that it pays uh, incredibly well to do kind of forensic audio type works. And one of the things that we get with WaveLab is going to be Sonic's restoration plugins. So if I wanted to come here, I could actually just say, okay, I have a file that is that has a lot of hiss. Now let's just go ahead and we'll bypass. To say we have a lot of hiss, kind of background noise. So here I could just literally just kind of take the hiss out. Again, if you want to bypass. Or if you wanted to only bypass the source, this is kind of an interesting. So that way you could actually hear kind of exactly what it's taking out. And we also are going to have a, if you have, you know, since so many people are getting back into vinyl, you know, and after they play the vinyl enough, uh, for those of us that kind of grew up on it, you realize that it may start to sound a bit like this so let's go ahead and we'll bypass the plug-in so a lot of crackles clicks pops and now we can just kind of so you could de-pop de-click de-crackle again if we bypass or just listen to the clicks by themselves so what's being filtered out you could do that as well so very effective restoration tools and you know these are you know very powerful for doing you know and it's kind of a whole world of people that just do kind of forensic audio and audio restoration so the declicking denoising that's included is is very powerful now, also kind of on the realm of doing, you know, these types of surgical edits, one of the views that we'll have again is, we'll come here, let's say we have a file here, and let's say we have a lot of low end, and we'll zoom here, and if you're a Cubase user, the keyboard shortcuts for zoom will be the same. So let's say I don't like that lead vocal at all or someone just coughed right in the middle of your bass or there's a squeaky bass drum pedal and a very uh, noticeable or squeaky piano pedal. Um, what we could do is kind of frequency bass editing. So we're used to, if I come here, 
where if we edit our audio, we could actually, you know, do all of our diff, you know, right click all of our typical processing, but that's going to take out every frequency that's a part of the wave file. But if we want it to be kind of independent, what we could do is when we come here, we go to edit tab and then we see this little spectrum editor. And again, this will switch us to our view here. And what this is going to show us is kind of the harmonic content. So we see our low frequencies. We can see where the hi hat comes in. And we could actually see where the voice comes in. It looks like it's going to come in right here. So we'll go ahead and just play. And what you're actually seeing, some people are like, okay, I only hear one voice, but it looks like there's almost like a chord going on. And what this is, is the harmonic overtone series. So we have kind of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth order harmonics. So what I'm going to do is I could actually just kind of select that by drawing a little box around it. And once we activate it, the spectral mode, I could go into what we call surgery mode. And at this point, I'm going to just say, uh, I'm just going to apply 48 dB filter. Now I didn't actually edit the hi hat, or I didn't edit the uh, the the bass frequency. So when you go to listen to it, you know, we can see just very quickly doing that. And I could do that several times to get it out even more, but you get the idea. Um, so I had someone who had a recording of their daughter's recital. And ironically, someone, a grandparent who was actually at the recital, their hearing aid battery was, was starting to go and it was beeping. Uh, and ironically, everyone could hear it except for the person whose hearing aid battery was going away. Uh, so what he was able to do is to just kind of find those particular frequencies and edit out those frequencies using this to kind of save the recording. Now we could also do some other interesting aspects. So, you know, can we can think of this as being kind of a frequency dependent editor. So if I wanted to undo that, we could do that. But let's say if I had something like uh, a song that was like a, a drum loop. So let's say I'll just have this drum loop repeat a number of times. Just remove the plug in. All right, now what I could do is, let's say I w had this file and I actually just really wanted to work only with the snare, but I wanted to add more reverb just to the snare, but I have just a stereo recording. What I could do is I could take this and let's say I wanted to run this through my reverb plugin. So I'm just gonna click here and we'll just put it on a little room works and you can put whatever plug in you want. So now when I play this back, everything, the whole track is going through the reverb, but we could also choose this to not go from surgery mode, but to take a selected range of audio and just be able to edit that audio. So if we look at this, what I want to do is I'm going to just zoom in and let's take a little bit of the snare frequency here. So now only the snare frequencies are being processed through the plugin. As opposed to I take it out. So that way you could have frequency independent effects processing through your master section. So if I say I only want that to be in the mid, uh, you know, I could also just kind of come here and choose for just the mids to be processed. In those frequencies. So that way you could kind of do, you know, very sophisticated editing, uh, kind of spectral based editing directly 
right there in your system with that as well. So really high quality restoration and kind of surgical editing functions. Uh, so we'll take a quick look uh, and see if there's any quick questions and we'll move on to our next section. Hope everyone's learning a couple of tips and tricks. Okay, so our next section, we'll see if there's any comments that are sneaking in. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay from when I present. All right, so let's take a look at some analysis options. Um, and this gets to be a really interesting part of the program as well. So when we want to do analysis, we can see kind of our metering as we indicated here. So if you wanna see like one Y, two Y, so our level frequency based metering. Now what gets to be really interesting is we can go to our analysis page. And once I come here, one of the cool things is you could actually have a 3D frequency analysis. And you could have basically, you know, your frequencies over your time. And if you wanted to kind of change uh, the 3D view of that. So if you wanna see what's going on harmonically with your piece of music, this is always a great way to kind of kill time in a session too. You just kind of pull this up and rotate it around. Um, so, but very, very powerful with that. Now, once we have this, there's also some other really interesting analysis options. So once I come here, I could do a global analysis of the audio file here. And it'll take just a couple seconds. And this can tell me a lot of interesting things. One, it could tell me where my peaks are in RMS, my true, where what it is at the cursor position, what my loudness is. And I could do that uh, in R128 metering. Or if I just wanted to see raw loudness, I could do that. If I was doing sample editing, it could determine the pitch. Uh, if there needs to be a DC offset, uh, and that's a kind of a great mastering trick a lot of people do is actually, you know, depending on the voltage in your actual facility with the audio, you might have to do a DC offset, but also errors. So sometimes you may have like one sample, and if you're dealing with like 192K sample rate, that could be 384,000 samples per second. But here you could actually have the program point out where there's any like overs or errors. And at this point, if I just go to my edit, I could grab my pencil tool. And let's say if I want to do it on both channels, I think I just hold down the shift key. And then I could actually just redraw the waveform if necessary, if there's a clip. So very powerful overall analysis to see what's going on. But one of the things that gets to be really fascinating is this concept of the audio file comparator. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a real English word or not, but what this is going to allow you to do is to actually compare different audio files. So if I wanted to come here, I could take, let's say I have several different files or like variations, um, and I want to see what the difference is. So let's say I have my original file here. And let's say I have one that's going to be like with more EQ on the top end, and we can see that graphically here. So versus this file, so it's the same file, or this one maybe has multiband compression on it. And let's say this one is encoded from an AAC file. So they all kind of sound similar. I mean, the one will obviously sound brighter than the original with the EQ. But if you actually want to determine the actual difference between the files, this is what the audio file comparator does. So at this point, I could say I want to take uh, my original file here. Let me just. And we're going to take our high EQ file and we could actually have it generate a delta file, which is the difference between those two files. So now when we play back, we see there's 22 million differences or so. This is what the actual EQ setting that we did 
actually applied. So again, this is the difference between those two audio files. Now let's do that between our, our original file and the multiband compression. And let's have it generate a delta file between the two. And this file has been created. So again, like 22 million or so differences. So this is the difference between those files. So this is the exact, uh, the exact processing that's been applied to the file. And you could listen to it in kind of a very scientific manner. But where it gets really fascinating is if we do this audio file comparator. So let's say I want to take my uh, my original file and I wanted to take it um, I think here's my AAC encoded file so if you want to know what the difference is between what the original 24-bit uh, WAV file and AAC which is often used on services like iTunes we can now just have it generate its Delta file hit OK and now Let's, let's see if I did that correctly. Let me just so do the original and our AAC. So let's go ahead and listen. So this is the exact difference of what goes on from uh, de encoding and decoding to AAC, the difference from the original. So again, these are the differences between the two. So if you ever have to try to explain why you don't want to deliver as an MP3, that's a great way of showing that. So again, all sorts of great analysis and delivery options with that. So uh, we'll take a little break. See, I'll just kind of see if there's any comments are coming in for questions on this part. If not, uh, we'll go on to our next section. Um, thanks everyone for watching us. See if you have questions, there's a little bit of delay, so I'll just kind of wait uh, a couple seconds and then we'll move on to our next section of the presentation. Hope everyone's learning a couple tricks. All right, so we'll move on to doing CD audio. Let me just make sure I didn't forget any other parts here before we move on. Okay, so when we want to do a basic audio CD, one of the things that we could do is we can just simply come directly here and say, Okay, we want to do, and from our file menu, we'll just go back to our main group here. We'll just choose our file menu, and we could do new basic audio CD. And from here, we could actually do a DVD audio, which could allow you to do like 24-bit 48K, 5.1, or 192 uh, stereo master. But we'll just kind of do this with our basic audio CD. So at this point, we will just say, I wanted to come here. And let's say I've done my processing, I've done all sorts of great effects. I have all of my CD tracks laid out for me here. Uh, what can we do at this point to make it uh, a little more interesting and compelling? So one of the things is if you wanted to adjust like pause times between tracks, you could actually just type in here. So I know, <coughs> excuse me, this artist didn't want any pause times between the tracks. So I'll just type in zero here. So 
So by default, it'll be two seconds of pause. So we'll just have that set to zero. And if I wanted to, at this point, we could put in like ISRC codes and other information. Um, we could add audio tracks. Um, so, but what I like to do is take it into kind of what we call the secondary audio editor. And that's what's called an audio montage. So I want to take this and I want to see what my CD is going to look like all completely laid out. So we'll just choose this to be a CD standard. And then I'll just use that. And now I could see all of my CD tracks laid out directly for me. So if I just want to play a little bit of it here. Now, first thing you may notice is you know, we're going to have our individual files laid out here. Now, one of the problems that people have when they do CD preparation is actually going to be handling, um, you know, consistency between different tracks. So you may notice that there's going to be, this one's probably softer than this track. So let's say I, want, I like this level for my particular tracks. What I could do is there's a function called the meta normalizer. And what this is gonna allow you to do is I could actually say, I want to match the selected, uh, the loudness of the selected audio clip. And then what this is gonna do is gonna take every file from my CD, and this is almost like magic, and we could do this by peak or you know, or by RMS, and what it's going to do is I'll just hit apply. It's going to do an analysis of each of the tracks, and now each of the tracks will match the loudness of that particular file. Like death and taxes and depression. Whoa, whoa, that's crying at me. Wonder what she dreams about. She was gone. So now as we jump here. Everything I now, one of the great things is just how you can treat audio in the montage. So if you wanted to just do crossfades, it's very simple. If I wanted this track to be louder or softer, I could just grab this point directly here. If I wanted to do, I wanted this clip to end here and I wanted to do a fade out, I could just kind of grab this little corner handle here and adjust my fade out. If I don't like the changes I did, I still have my unlimited levels of undo and my unlimited levels of redo as well. So let's say we've equalized kind of the clip volumes here. And then when we come and listen to some of the tracks, this one sounds a lot more muffled than the other tracks in comparison. So we go back to this one. So kind of very muffled AM radio. And let's say that wasn't intentional. So one of the plugins we give you is the Voxengo Curve EQ. And this has some very powerful uh, functions. So what we want to do is basically take the sonic fingerprint of one file and be able to apply it to multiple files. So what I want to do is we're going to put this into average mode and we're going to just put it into static. So what I want to do is take kind of an EQ fingerprint of this file. So it's figuring out what frequencies are there. And once it kind of settles in, I can click on take. And let's listen to this. And what it's doing is it's taking the frequencies of this file. We can see it kind of dial in. So let's do a take of that. So let's go ahead and what I want to do now 
I want to use the second one as a reference and apply it to this file and match the frequencies. Wonder what she dreams about. I wonder if she's happy with the way my life turns. So again, if we bypass. That's where we were. And now being able to kind of take the EQ curve of one file and apply it to another one can just bring that right back in line directly with uh, the file. So it doesn't, you don't have to feel like it's completely a different color, that it's from a different recording, a different century. You can just have, and this is also used kind of a great way of using it as a, a resource for, okay, I really liked, you know, how this artist record turned out. We could do that and be able to kind of see everything uh, laid out exactly as we want and to be have those consistent levels, <coughs> excuse me, and that consistent tonal characteristics as well. So that can be incredibly powerful uh, tool. So again, one of the plugins that's included, the Voxango Curve EQ, and if you're a Cubase user, you also have that inside of Cubase as well. Now, if we wanted to get ready to burn our CD, we could see our CD tracks laid out here. If we wanted to put in our ISRC codes, our CD texts, and we could go to your functions menu and there's a CD wizard. So here you could put in uh, you know, additional metadata directly here, or if you wanted to you know, just put in your CD text so that the album would be carried over. Um, now, some people mistake that CD text is what's read uh, from a lot of online services, and it's really not the case. It actually will just kind of reference it uh, from a database. Uh, but you could also have a audio CD report generated. So if I wanted to just come here, we could say, let's just go and here's our audio CD report that it's just created as you could do it as a PDF file or a web page. Uh, so you could have kind of all the metadata that you would choose to want to have. And when you go to burn the CD, um, you could choose, I don't have a burner directly in my system. So if I wanted to select my CD or DVD drive, or you could write uh, a DDP image directly from here as well. So this is really, you know, very easy way to have your effects and all of your consistency on an audio CD as well. Now there's some other interesting cases of uh, audio editing, when one that I wanted to point out, because uh, we have a lot of people do WaveLab, not just for mastering, but for stuff like, you know, recording books on tape uh, and a lot of different uh, dialogue text. So let me just find one file, uh, show you something that came up where we had some radio stations that had WaveLab, and one of the things they wanted to do was to censor the audio a bit. So if they had, the only person above like, you different dialogue. What's seven? And so I asked you that question, Victor Lane. So one of the things that you could do is actually come here, and if you, you know, if you kind of know what the material is, you could actually have it play back, and like, a said, little faster. It's a little too soon to think about that. Have you had a chance to think about the history? So you don't have to listen to it in real Sunday time. At, uh, so you could actually Sonoma. choose kind of different yeah, rates. You know, it's, it's but if you had to put in, like, uh, let's say they said a word that's not fit for broadcasting, one of the functions that you could actually do here is to actually go to a silence generator. So you could actually just put in silence. But one of the things I did is I actually, and part of the program is you could have a test tone generator. So I had to generate like a 1K uh, test tone. And then I could actually just come here and just put in stuff like this. So, yeah, you know, it's tough one right like you know it's it's so if, you, if you wonder how people do that that's often you could just replace kind of the background silence with that or replace it with another wave file to do that so a lot of people use you know wave lab for doing these types of tasks and one of the things that people do is often within the montage we you know it's it's really ideally suited for doing cds but it's not really limited to that so let's say if i have just like a bed of music here and again, if I wanted this bed to be louder, I could just grab the center line. So it's a very object-oriented softer. But our way in 
side of the montage in the wave lab elements i think you had three stereo tracks to work with in the full montage you could have unlimited tracks so if i click here i could actually add a stereo track and let's say if i just wanted to have a voiceover and i could actually just move this track up uh, and I just wanted to right click here and I could actually insert uh, another file. Let me see if I had it recently. So let's say if I wanted to do something as simple as like I'll just have a little welcome. Oops, that's the wrong file. Let me just find another file here. So let's say I just take this file. Welcome to. So what I could do is, is if I want it to have it automatically duck, you know, like as soon as the voiceover, and this is used in a lot of radio spots, um, I could actually just kind of, and within the montage, again, it's incredibly flexible. So if I wanted to come here and just choose to, you know, you know, let me see if I find my right keyboard shortcut, but if you... You know, and things are very kind of right clickable. So depending on where you are, you know, there's kind of different mouse zones and you get a lot of different functions. So I'm going to select this track here and I wanted to duck. So I'm going to just simply right click here and I want it to duck according to the previous track. So now anytime that a voiceover comes in, this track can automatically duck down. And if I wanted to, again, just kind of take a section of the audio, you know, I could just increase the volume here. Uh, if I hit the E key, that would actually take me directly back out to my main edit screen. And then I could just simply go directly back to my montage if it's been saved. Now, once we do this, you know, the montage, if I just wanted to come here and, you know, right click, cut paste and you know let's say i just wanted to you know move this file a number of different places and let's paste again and i just want to do my crossfades i wanted this to be louder so as you can see it gets to be kind of a very object oriented audio assembly tool um so people use it for doing radio spots all the time the montage editor now where it could also get to be very interesting is within the montage editor you could go to your effects tab and if you wanted to you could have your effects here on the main section so i could have all of my effects be routed through my master section like we saw before so if i wanted it to go through the master rig but i could also choose just to have effects on a clip so if you actually just kind of click right here i can add an effect slot so if i wanted to add let's say just that uh a little bit of the declicker directly here on that clip, but not through everything, we could do that as well. Now, once we kind of come here, you could actually have this, again, be any way that you wanted to. So if I wanted that to only be in the mid, left, right, mid, side. Uh, but there's also some interesting things where you could actually, if you wanted to have this be parallel processing. So now as I adjust uh, my my level here. This could actually be the the uh, parallel processing for the envelope. So you could have a number of effects go through the master section or go directly through uh, individual processing right here within the montage. Now, once a lot of people kind of get done with the project, they often have to mix it down. And that's where this render option starts. And with today's, <coughs> excuse me, with today's kind of production environment, we're often mixing down perhaps a 24-bit 192, a 2448 for video, 2444.1 uh, as a higher resolution, a 16-bit 44.1 for CD, MP3, a FLAC, an AAC. So that can be tricky to actually set up multi exports if you wanted to. So if we go to our render here from the master section, one of the clever things that you could actually do is set up a multi render. And at this point, um, 
if I wanted to, I could just actually pull up. And if I wanted to do, I could say, okay, let's just do kind of the whole montage so I could take my bed here. And then what you're able to do is to say, once we have this set up, is to the point where you can say, okay, I want it to automatically export uh, to, you know, six different file formats and to combine them uh, directly within the actual file as well. So that way I could do a multi-render. So if I just wanted to come here, and again, we could just say, And let's see if I have this saved. I thought I had it. So at that point, you could have it automatically spit out six or seven or ten different file formats when you do uh, render the file itself. So at that point, uh, it gets to be you know a very powerful way to actually render your different files. Now, something else that people use WaveLab for a lot is for setting up, you know, different mo different audio uh, batch processes. And batch processes could be uh, a little daunting at first when you think about it. But what it is, it's basically saying that I want it to do, uh, you know, these effects processing, this dithering, the, all these different files and processes to a particular file uh, or to a group of files in one fell swoop. So instead of doing a render to a number of different files, what we could do is actually just come directly here and we'll choose, um, I could just add some audio files. So I'll just browse and we just add some quick audio files. So now I have these audio files selected and what I could do, and you'll see a little breakout tab and I could choose that. Okay. I have these master section presets saved. Uh, but let's say, you know, I wanted to run it through, uh, this delay, or let's just choose maybe my master rig plugin. So at this point, I could say, let's just do it through uh, my master rig. And I wanted to have it do, you know, also my loudness meta normalizer. So you could add different components here. And it will go through and actually do a, and then you'd say start. And what it will do is you could take like 10,000 different audio files that are at 48K and convert it to an MP3 or 10,000 files from 48K to 44.1. Or you could do a multi-export as well as part of the batch process. Um, so I had a client who is working on a game uh, where the audio engine for that they're using for the iPad platform required 20 samples of silence before the audio file could be grabbed to play back. Um, and this was, you know, thousands of audio files. So they just set the folder and said, insert 20 samples of silence into every single audio file and just said, go. And it will do that for you in the background. So if you're working with large numbers of audio files, this is uh, a really phenomenal tool for being able to do batch processing. Now, one of the things that they also wanted to do <clears throat> to make it a little more approachable is a concept of a watch folder. So let's say if I wanted to uh, come here and I have a folder on my desktop and we could set this up in WaveLab in a number of different ways. So let's say I have this folder and I've specified this uh, in wave lab and we could go to our tool windows and we could set up a watch folder and what a watch folder will allow you to do is to set up a folder that's in that's linked to a batch process so in this batch process i have it set up to do 
a 24-bit wave, a 16-bit wave, an AUG Vorbis, an AAC, an MP3, and to categorize it into different folders. So once I go directly here, let's say I have a WAV file, and this is my watch folder. As I drop it in, we could now just have that automatically create our different watch folders here. So let me just activate it in WaveLab here. So I'm just going to activate. So now even if WaveLab isn't open, let me just find a quick wave file here. So I'll grab this file. I'm just going to save it into that folder. And now when I go to edit the folder, if I didn't do the wrong thing, sorry about that. So now that it's been copied into that folder, I can now go to this folder and that will automatically just put that file into different uh, folders with all the encoding without WaveLab actually being open. Um, so that way any file that's saved to your, uh, that's saved directly to that folder can be execute a batch process. Now there's some other little things that WaveLab can do that are kind of interesting that a lot of people miss. Um, so if you wanted to, there's also going to be, you know, very sophisticated audio split functionality, signal generators. So if you wanted to generate different, you know, pink noise, white noise, different test tones, you're able to do that. Uh, DTMF, so that's like touch tones for telephony applications uh so but just a wide variety of different tools that are available and again we could think of this uh you know total batch conversion batch renaming of files so when you're dealing with large number of audio files where it's for a game or for you know different multimedia purposes you know wave lab is really you know as opposed to a traditional daw that's using kind of a recording studio paradigm. You know, WaveLab can be a much kind of better trick uh, to do that. And one of my friends had just, you know, a great description of WaveLab of whenever he was in a problem, you know, WaveLab would always solve it and just kind of seem to be, have the correct tool for that. So whether you want to do, you know, basic effects processing, just playing back files, doing all of your audio editing, being able to do processing at mid-side, having a smart bypass, the encoder checker, being able to burn CDs, being able to make audio files by dragging them to the desktop, being able to do uh, all of your analysis, having your audio file comparator, having uh, you know the batch processing, the CD burning, DVD audio burning, the audio montage, uh, and again, those intrinsic links between Cubase and WaveLab with the WaveLab exchange and being able to open up the projects again inside of Cubase, you know, can really make it a very compelling solution for a lot of needs. So, you know, again, you know, the one thing that you can do to, you know, really improve the quality of your audio at the final stage, you know, from different encoding options to different delivery methods is using WaveLab. And of course, we can't forget the incredible master rig plugin for you know every mastering process for you know left, right channels, independent, mid, side, independent control, stereo. So having a dynamic EQ, an eight band EQ, where you can type in the frequencies, you know, you're gonna have uh, multi-band compression, multi-band uh <clears throat> you know <clears throat> multi-band saturation multi-band uh stereo width control as well as like very comprehensive limiting 
can really make for just a great, great solution. So if you have Wave Lab, I think you probably picked up a couple of tricks. Uh, but if you don't have Wave Lab, you should really check it out because it's a really powerful tool. Um, I'm going to read through some of the questions and comments, and we'll see if you guys have questions. Uh, we'll go through those. Uh, and if not, we'll go ahead and wrap up. We'll see if any questions. Uh, good to see Jay online. Hope you're having fun in Alexandria. Jay lives a couple blocks away from me, but we only see each other on on these uh, hangouts, unfortunately. All right, so we'll, I'll just hang on a minute. There's usually a little bit of a delay, so I'll just uh, see if there's any questions that come up. Uh, if not, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Hope that everyone has learned a couple tips and tricks. And if you want more, we have some more Wave Lab tutorial videos coming online soon. But again, if you have tips, tricks, just uh, or questions, real quick before we wrap up, please feel free to ask. Okay, so with the spectral editing, you know, you, what we could do is set it up and we'll jump back to uh, that section. So let's say, just go to this file group here. So with spectral editing, what you can do is to, so I'll take a selection of the audio. Let me just find and be able to filter out specific audio so and again this question was what was about spectral editing what can you do so if you wanted to filter out uh, specific audio modes you can go to surgery mode here and then you could choose to just dampen the audio or you could take selected frequencies and run them through plugins in the master section So I see a question from Jay. Uh, did it start on time? Yeah, we started at 1 o'clock. I think you could probably just jump back and watch it. It should be offline to watch pretty soon. See if there's any other questions. All right, so we'll wait just a little longer, and there's often a little delay. If not, we'll go ahead and wrap up. See a couple comments coming in. All right, we'll just wait just one more minute and then we'll close down if there's no questions. Did, I hope, did everyone learn a couple tips and tricks? See some cool stuff in there? Yeah, and if you guys want to see more Wave Lab live streams, we could do that as well. So, and you know, during any of the Club Cubase hangouts, everyone is, you know, it's open for any Steinberg products. So if you have Wave Lab questions for the Google Hangouts or the Club Cubase hangouts, we'll be glad to answer them there as well. Right, let's see if there's any more questions. I see a comment on YouTube or Spotify. So you can have it automatically, you know, go. I think you could also just have it go to SoundCloud directly as well, but you can have your different encoding formats for different services.
Okay, so you see a question, is there any uh, loudness reference that you can find anywhere? So um, for broadcast, what a lot of people are gravitating to is this meter. So we could actually see a loudness meter here. Um, so let's say if I wanted to play just a little bit, let me just jump to some... So, and what this is, is kind of loudness units or R128 metering. So if you kind of look at this, we can see this is kind of where ideally you'd want to be as a reference. Uh, still in the, you know, record world, people want to have louder sounding records, um, which you could do as well. But if you want it to be used for broadcast, you know, you have kind of this meter we see for peak and RMS, but loudness units is kind of becoming more the preferred metering standard. And you want that to be at like minus 23 LUFS and you can kind of see all the metering for the loudness standards there. So uh, some people will take another track as a reference and you could match that as well, doing the uh, meta normalizer if you wanted to, like we showed for the CD burning part. Let's see if there's any other questions. All right, I'll wait just a second. If not, we'll wrap up. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for the Wave Lab Hangout. And uh, we'll just wait one more minute. If not, we'll wrap up. All right, with that, we like I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining the Hangout. I uh, hope everyone's learned a tip or trick. And... Uh, We'll see you next time. We'll probably be doing a Club Cubase Google Hangout uh, next week, maybe next Wednesday. We'll have the date set uh, probably by tomorrow. So thanks for joining us. Hope you all learned something, and uh, we'll get uh, we'll get going soon. And we'll talk to you later. Bye. Just.